In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, it is with great joy that we gather together and begin this new live lecture series. So it's exactly 1 p.m. right now. I know many people will be logging in. So we'll just give people a few seconds, maybe, maybe a minute or so, so that everybody can log in, and then we'll go ahead and begin. So until then, I'll just ask you to say a small prayer as you log in. And um, let's say a prayer so that the Holy Spirit can speak to all of us as we're all going to participate in this live lecture series, okay? So we'll give people just a minute to be able to log in. All right, my beloved, we'll go ahead and jump right in, shall we? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So this is some crazy times that we are living in. It's it's funny because many of us have seen these kind of things in movies. We've been entertained by these kind of, you know, sci-fi movies or these like dramatic horror movies where we see the streets getting empty and these things taking over. And it's a little bit crazy to think that we're actually living throughout something that is so historical. Now, I, I want to begin by first addressing the topic of our conversation today. I want you to know that we're going to spend maybe 20, 25 minutes where I'm going to share with you some thoughts, especially about how the early church understood how it is that we deal with evil in the world. And that's why today's lecture is actually, um, it focuses on how it is that we deal with evil in the world. So we're going to spend 20, 25 minutes on that. And then afterwards, I'm going to invite everyone who's participating. Please feel free to submit your questions. We'll take another half hour where I'll try my best to be able to answer some of your questions. We'll learn together. We'll grow together. So, beloved, uh, if you have any questions along the way, write them down. And as, send, as soon as I say, go ahead and write them in the comments. I'll see them appear. I see some of you are always uh, already sending out some comments. That's wonderful. I'm happy to see them. I won't be able to read them right now. I'll pay more focus to them. Um, as soon as we get into the Q&A part of this. So let's go ahead and begin with this whole idea of evil. Is there evil in the world? Absolutely. And you'd be crazy to think otherwise. I want you to understand that it's how we approach the evil that is found in the world that's totally going to change how it is that the Lord is going to allow us or we're going to allow ourselves to let the Holy Spirit work in us. So I want us to first speak about this because right now we're living in a period of time where we see a variety of different opinions. And it's a little bit scary to hear some of the things that are being said. I want you to imagine, if you wish, that there is one spectrum. Now, there are some people who live on this side of the spectrum, and there are other people who live on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. So let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. There are some people who live on the spectrum of all you need is faith. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you are not required to have a sense of responsibility? Does that mean that you are not res responsible for your own actions? Does that mean that God is capable of protecting you even from yourself if you are careless? I'm just posing questions. I'm not making any statements. The other extreme are the people who say, no, God gave us a mind. You got to use it. Forget all this mystical stuff. Forget all the spiritual stuff. Don't speak to me about mysteries. Don't speak to me about the power of relationship with God. What we need to do is lock ourselves up stock our shelves for enough food to be able to feed my family for a year, toilet paper galore, and I'm not really sure where people are getting this, but it's fine if people want to stock up on toilet paper and sanitizer and cans of soup enough to feed their family for a year, that's perfectly up to them. But here's my question to you. What does this say about the faith that you had? What does this say about the idea of you trusting in God's sovereign goodwill? What does this say about you putting yourselves at the mercy of the Lord and saying, Lord, I'll do what I have to do, but I need you to protect. I have faith. I have hope for eternal life. Where are we right now? What end of the spectrum do we stand on? Beloved, I want to be able to urge all of you to not stand on one extreme or the other, but rather to have a balanced mindset. I actually want us to have the mind of Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul writes to all of us, and he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to talk about the humility 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins to talk about kenotic activity, this idea of self-emptying that was in Jesus. I want us to go further than what St. Paul was saying. I want us to also have the mind of Christ in the sense where I want us to think like our God, the creator of the world. I want us to experience things the way he experienced it when he was in the flesh and lived among us. I want us to be able to be encouraged by the word of scripture, but at the same time, not to take a single verse out of its context, but rather to read things in their totality. So let's speak about evil, shall we? We've already agreed. There is definitely evil in the world. But what is the author of that evil? Where is it coming from? Now, there are some people who believe that God is the author of evil. And they excuse that statement by saying, well, God is the author of all things, and you cannot question God. And therefore, if he decides that he is the author of evil, then you have no say. You are nothing but a creature. You are made out of dust. You ought to submit to that. You ought to be quiet, and you ought to accept it. Beloved, this is not the God that we believe in. We believe exactly as stated in the book of Genesis that when God created all things, he created them good. As a matter of fact, after the six days of creation, the author of the book of Genesis says, and the Lord saw that everything he had created was very good. He is not the creator of evil. I actually want you to begin to see evil differently. Evil is not so much something that has a substance. It doesn't have an essence. But rather, it is the absence of God's goodness. And when God created you and me, all of humanity, Christian, non-Christians, believers, non-believers, all of us, bear his image and likeness. We were granted the faculty of being creative, of being compassionate, of being self-aware, and most importantly, of being free. He gave us free will. What does that mean? It means that God has a very specific will for us. But he wants us to align our will to his. Do you understand that? Do you understand that what that really means is that while you are free, the ultimate and divine expression of free will is for you to give up your freedom and say, Lord, not as I will, but as you will. Is that not what we see the Lord Jesus Christ himself doing in John chapter 17? In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is praying, and we see a little bit of this in John 16, and it continues into John 17. When we read about this whole idea of how it is that even the son himself says, not my will, but yours. He prays in the gospel of St. Luke and he says, if you can take this cup away from me, but nevertheless, your will, not mine. The ultimate expression of true free will is when we say, Lord, I choose to take my freedom and I offer it to you. This is where we ought to be, beloved. This is where we have to be. Because for us to understand both the goodness that is in the world and the evil that is in the world is to also understand that God is not the author of that. Now, there are some people who will say things like what? What we are living right now is very clearly the wrath of God. It is God who is angry at us. It is God who is very upset at the fact that humanity has turned away. And as such, God's anger, his wrath have been aroused. And so this virus is from him. I need us to think about that for just a second. Do we believe in a God who in his anger, in his emotional state of passion, that somehow humanity has crossed the line, we have stepped on his shoes, he is upset, we have offended him, and that means that God is somehow offendable. And in the process of being offended, he says, enough is enough, I will create a creation like this virus that will go out and hurt my own children. And I will author it because I want to scare them. I want to punish them. I want to inspire in them fear because the only way they will come back to me is if I whip them into shape. Is this the God that we see on the cross? Is this the God we hear of who says, I will send my only begotten son? Is this the God who, while he is crucified on the cross, will say, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My beloved, it is very clear to us in Scripture that a lot of the evils, if not all of them, that we see really come from us. A humanity that is broken. A humanity that has fallen away. A humanity that refuses to align their will to the will of God. I want to read to you from the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon speaks to us 
And he says that in his wisdom, he has come to a conclusion. He says the following in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. St. Basil the Great, in the liturgy that he writes and leaves for us, we pray in the prayer of reconciliation and we say, O God, the Great, the Eternal, who formed man in what? In corruption? In brokenness? In death? In darkness? No. Who created man in incorruption. You and I were created to be incorrupt. But what have we done? In our state of brokenness, in our state of selfishness, in our state of even, and forgive me for saying this, of self-worship, the human being is capable of taking the goodness that God has given him and use it for the sake of evil. So some people might be asking and saying, Abuna, are you then saying that somehow humanity is responsible for this virus? I would like to say, I think we have contributed to it. And if we're not contributing to it, then what does it matter? What does it matter for us to somehow find the culprit and say, oh, it's this people who have created it. It's those people who have created it. This is some sort of biological warfare. None of those things matter at the moment. The most important thing is to realize that we need to close our ears to those who would say that the Christian God that we believe in is somehow the God who has authored this evil into existence. Now, some people will hear this and they will say, but Abuna, we read of God's anger and we read of God's wrath in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, we even see the Lord Jesus Christ himself get angry in the New Testament, in the way that he deals with the people. And you're absolutely right. I'm not saying that God's anger and God's wrath don't exist. They very much exist. We are capable of being angry. We take that from the fact that we're created in God's image. And there is an anger that exists that is righteous. So we should never assume that God is not capable of being those things. But never, never should we allow ourselves to limit God's expression of anger and wrath to our own understanding. You see, to us, whenever we hear the word angry or the word anger, we immediately assume that it is something bad. But that is not true. We are meant to be created in God's image to also express anger. But anger towards what? And how is it supposed to be expressed? If I get angry at my children because they are hurting each other, should I then, as a good father, take my children and inflict pain on them? So that way, that by spanking them or hurting them or emotionally or verbally abusing them, think to myself, this is me being a good father. Because the next time they think of doing something bad, they will remember what I have done to them. And so they will remember the pain that I inflicted on them. And so in the process of them thinking that I will punish them every time they do something wrong, they will stop the evil that they commit. What would you say of me as a father? If I did that to my children, that if I justified my anger, my violence, my vengeance on my children by saying this is for their own sake, what would you say of me? Would you not call child protection on me? And now we take that level of anger and we project it on our Lord, our God, our Savior. How? We can't do that, beloved. I want to read to you from the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet is writing down the words that were given to him by God. And the Lord says the following, If a wicked man turns from all of his sins which he has committed, and he keeps all my statutes and does, it, does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. But Lord, I thought you said that those who commit those sins, that they will be punished. Yes, of course, but if they repent, I want them to live. I am not the kind of God who stands there, who draws a line in the sand and who says, as soon as you cross it, the moment you cross it, I couldn't care less about you. I said a law, you cross that line, you are deserving of death. This is not what we're reading in scripture. Let's continue reading. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. And then he asks the following question. Do I have, this is the Lord speaking, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Beloved, we believe in a God who very clearly says that I do not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he returns and live. And so to now ascribe this evil that we see in the form of this virus to God and to say this is him punishing us, this is him wanting death upon us, this is him cracking down his whip. Beloved, this is not what we believe. I want us to please focus in on this. 
We do not believe in a God who does this. So where do we understand this evil then? St. Basil, in his writings, he speaks of this idea of how it is that we have to associate this evil back to its original source. So we read in his homilies on the Hexameron, in the books of Genesis, and he says the following, no one who is in this world will deny that evil exists. What then do we say? That evil is not a living and animated substance, but a condition of the soul which is opposed to virtue and which springs up in the slothful because of their failing away from God. When we see evil in this world, it is not so much a reflection of who God is, but rather a reflection of where we stand in relationship with him. Humanity has fallen away from God. Humanity has decided to, cre- to use its creative faculties to turn against God. And in the process, we live in a humanity that is broken, a humanity that is selfish, a humanity that does not have any compassion, that goodness is slowly fading away. The truth is no longer important. Beloved, as Christians, we really need to start seeing what the message is right now. We have been given an opportunity, you and I, I don't think we fully understand what this opportunity is. As a matter of fact, I really want us to be able to really understand what it means for us to say that God created you and me free. Do you realize that this means that in your freedom you can reject God? Do you understand that that means that if God does stand at the door of your heart and he knocks, you could tell him, I don't care about you? Can you? Can you imagine a person speaking like that to the president, to the prime minister, to the queen, to the king, to the emperor? Can you imagine a person who's working in customer service speaking to the CEO of his multi-billion dollar company in that way? Can you imagine the awkwardness that would exist if you witness such an event? That this person who has no stature speaks to a person of extremely high stature and says, I couldn't care less about you. This is the freedom that was granted to you. You can, re- you can say, I don't want you. But in the grace that he has given you in your freedom, you can also say, I want to be yours. As a matter of fact, you can say, I won with you. Now, there are those in the world who will say we want nothing to do with God. What will our stance be in light of all of the evil that surrounds us? What will we do with the opportunity that has been given to us? Now, some of you might think that that's not the right word. I don't think this is an opportunity. I really think we're living through a state of chaos. A period of history where we're surrounded by so many evil things. Beloved, I actually want us to change our mindset. I want us to take a step back and realize this is a huge opportunity. How many of us have complained that we never have time? How many of us have said, I can't open my Bible. I don't have the time for it. By the time I get home, all I want to do is crash. How many of us have said, my studies have taken over my time? How many have said, by the time I come home and I finished a 10-hour day and I and I, I get sit down with my children and I do my their homework, uh, by the end of it, I can't stand crash. I want to sleep. How many of us have said that we don't have the luxury of being able to connect with God because of our hectic schedules? And now, all we have is time. We have been granted a period where we can truly connect with God. What are we doing with it? Are we sitting in front of Netflix and chilling? Are we grabbing our cell phones and scrolling like without ceasing? And in the process of scrolling, we are filling our minds with all of these chaotic statements. The spirit of fear has overtaken the media. The spirit of panic has overtaken our grocery stores, our pharmacies, our streets. We see our neighbors closing the doors and looking outside the windows. We see people who are panicking because they don't know what to do. The spirit of fear has taken over. And all we're doing is scrolling social media, looking at stats, hearing about all of these conspiracy theories of who started it and how did it start, hearing people on social media blaming God, blaming the church. The church can do no right right now in the eyes of some people. If you open the church, the church is irresponsible. If you close the church, ah, look, a lack of faith. If the priest extends his hand so that the parishioner can take the blessing of Christ, that priest is being irresponsible and he's putting people at risk. If the priest removes his hand, look, that priest has no faith and he's forbidding us from taking the blessing of Christ. There are people right now who all they are doing is sitting down in a seat of judgment and trying to figure out who's guilty, who's right, who's wrong, and in the process, 
they are investing all of their mental, emotional, and spiritual energy into things that are useless, and dare I say, even destroying them. We cannot be like that, beloved. We are surrounded by evil. But how do we make sense of it? We make sense of the evil by shining a light in a time of darkness. Someone once said, we throw lemons at God. And what does he do? He takes those lemons and he makes lemonade. It's a silly example. But I want us to realize that that's what we are called to do as Christians. You have been granted time. Don't invest it by filling your mind and your heart with thoughts of things that are going to inspire fear within you. On the contrary. Beloved, find for yourself a corner in your room. Set up an icon. Light a candle. Pray. Turn to him. Ask him to be your savior yet again. Ask him to inspire you with the spirit of wisdom and discernment to know how to inspire another generation. How to help your brother, your sister, your child, your wife, your husband. How to be able to be a light in this period where everyone's closing themselves in. And yet at the same time, everyone wants to be selfishly isolated, thinking that everyone else is a threat to them. Why don't we pray for the world? Why don't we turn to God and say, Lord, change me? I've never had this much time, Lord. Now is the time for you to take this event that has happened because of an evil and turn it into a moment or an opportunity for it to me to be transformed. Beloved, I want us to understand That if we are to speak of the wrath of God or the anger of God, if it is willed and permitted by him, it's not a God who holds a whip and who wants to crack it down on us. On the contrary, everything that God allows has a purpose for you and me to be saved. Now, some of you might be saying, how is that even possible, Abuna? If God permitted this, and I'm sure he did, then how are we to understand that it could be for good? Well, let me share with you a few examples. I was reading about how it is that there were periods where the church was closed under times of persecution. And in the 11th century, there was actually a governor or a caliph. forgive me, I don't know what the exact title of the people who ruled over Egypt uh, at the time were called. I don't know their exact titles. But he basically wanted to annihilate Christianity. He wanted to end it. And so he decided we're closing all the churches. If there is a church at every second street corner, if there is a church in every village, I want to shut it down. Because if I shut down the churches, and then it says that for nine years, nine years, churches were shut down. Liturgies, prayer meetings, all of the times that the people gather together in church to worship, nine years the church was shut down. And then it talks about how it is in history, that same Khalifa or that governor or that leader, he's walking through the streets and he begins to hear from the cracks of every window the voices of people in their homes praying and praising God. And he went absolutely nuts. Do you know why he went nuts? He went nuts because immediately he thought to himself, this has backfired. I wanted to close down maybe 40, 50, 60, 100 churches, one at every corner of every street, thinking that it would kill Christianity. But instead, what did I get? What was the response of the Holy Spirit within the hearts and the souls of every believer? That if they are going to shut down our buildings, then we will turn every one of our homes into a church. And so he reopened the churches. I wonder, can we capitalize on this? Can we use this moment now so that every one of our homes becomes a living and active church on fire by the Holy Spirit, not inflicted with a spirit of fear or panic, but rather that we are overtaken with the fire of the Spirit so that our homes become true expressions of prayer and praise. I want to put out this evil is by participating in it and allowing the Holy Spirit to transfigure this evil into an opportunity for glory in God's name. This is a feast for us as well, but the entire world. This is why in the institution narrative, when the priest or the bishop pray the liturgy, the prayer that we are suffering, this isolation, the spirit of panic, the shutting down of our economy, all of these things. And we said, Lord, let all glory be to you. Glory to God in all things. Lord, we will use this time, we will use this period of our cross 
so that we can be led to resurrection? What if we said we wanted to be transformed? What if we said they wanted to isolate us? The devil used this to shut down our churches. We can no longer have Bible studies or youth meetings or family gatherings or Sunday school. But we will take all of these things and every father in his home will be a priest. And every mother in her home will be the greatest of servants. And every child will learn the word of God from his own household. That every home will praise his name. That every family will gather together and pray and ask for his love and his mercy. Beloved, I cannot tell you how great of an opportunity we really have. Rather than saying this is the wrath of God and having a one-sided mindset toward what the wrath of God means, I urge you. I urge you, don't do that. Don't point the finger at God. Do we believe in a God who is capable of being angry? Of course we do. Do we believe in a God who has shown us what his wrath looks like? Of course we do. But you have to understand that what he permits and in an expression of anger and in wrath, it's always for our salvation. We need to capitalize on this because even this can be for our salvation. I'm actually reminded of a passage in the Gospel of St. Luke where the disciples walk into Samaria with Jesus and they're very upset at the reaction of some people towards Christ. So the disciples turn to him in Luke chapter 9 and they tell him, Lord, what would you want us to do right now? Lord, should we send down fire from heaven to destroy these people, to consume them? Now the disciples, you can clearly see that they've read Isaiah. And so they think, what, what not Isaiah, forgive me. They've read the, 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 the life of Elijah. And they're thinking to themselves, well, that's what Elijah did, right? He commanded fire down from heaven and it consumed all of the evil people. That's clearly what God wants. God wants to destroy his enemies. God wants to consume the people. Set an example of how strong and mighty and powerful he is, how vengeful he is. What was the reaction of Christ, my beloved? Let's read it, shall we? In this passage, in Luke chapter 9, it says the following. And the people did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. But when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, you don't know the mind of God. You don't know why I am angry. I'm not angry at people. I'm not angry at my children. I'm not wrathful towards them. I am angry and wrathful towards evil. We must understand everything in its proper context. Beloved, I urge you, I urge you, when we see evil, do not be tempted to be dissuade to be turned away from the truth and to point the finger at God but rather let us do what Christ did that when we see this evil when we are thrown lemons at if you wish we must turn it into an opportunity to grow we must turn it into an opportunity where you and I are capable of being transformed that while we are undergoing our own small crucifixion in carrying our crosses that we have hope in the resurrection. So what does that mean for you and me? Well, ultimately what it means is that you and I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to listen to the authorities. We have a responsibility to pray for our fathers, the bishops and the priests who are trying to do their best despite this difficult time. To not judge whether or not the decisions are right or wrong. It took too long. They did it too quickly. Beloved, if we actually did according to God's will, and obeyed both the church and the authorities, and submitted ourselves to God in our own homes, pursued him aggressively through our fast, and gathering and inspiring people to have a spirit of peace, and asking about one another, and praying for one another. My beloved, I promise you, what will end up happening is that we will see God manifest among us. He will change our homes. And when the church is reopened, it will be the union of hundreds of churches, Hundreds of homes coming together. And that will form the true body of Christ that maybe some of us have been lacking in seeing because we've been so broken and separated. What a great opportunity has been set before us. What a great opportunity has been set for us to be able to take this period and to offer it back to God. We must be inspired. We must be hopeful. We must turn to him and trust in all that he has done for us. Beloved, I cannot tell you how excited I personally am. As a matter of fact, I want to be honest with you. I just came back from outside the country. And Canada has a law that says that I have to quarantine myself and my family for 14 days. So for the next 14 days, I'm not praying liturgies. For the next 14 days, I'm not stepping outside my home. So what am I going to do? 
Should I stay home and cry or call my bishop and complain and say how it is? It's not fair. I want to pray the liturgies too. It's enough that the people can't pray. I am a priest. I deserve to pray. No. Because my entire life can be liturgy. Because all of my prayers and my entire expression of my relationship with him can be Eucharistic. Is there anything that is comparable to the grace and to the blessing and the mystery of the Eucharistic offering at the altar? No. But to act as if that is the be-all, end-all of the expression of my Christianity would be foolish. My orthodoxy teaches me that I can live every day in my home liturgically. That I can, every prayer that I make, that every time I think of God, that every time I turn to Him, that could be a Eucharistic offering, an offering of true thanksgiving. So I'm going to use these 14 days. I'm going to fill them with opportunities like this where I speak to you and learn from you and hear from you. I'm going to pick up my phone and call those people who need to hear a voice that inspires them to have a spirit of peace. I will not waste my time in reading people's posts about how everyone is dying and things like this and that, and this is what's happening in Europe, and this is what's happening, and none of that. I don't have time for that. What I have time for now is my Bible. What I have time for now is my own personal prayer. What I have time now is to burn out every candle in my home because I'm going to light one every day for hours at a time. And say offerings and prayers and praises to my Lord and my God. We have an opportunity. I'm in quarantine. I pray that you go into quarantine also. Go into isolation. Hold on to your kids. Love them. Pray with them and for them. Tell your spouse everything that you haven't had a chance to say over the last period. Grow together. Pray together. Call your neighbor. Call your family. Reconcile to that relative that you haven't seen or spoken to in forever. Call those people that. You know you've wronged and wish for them that their houses and their hearts may be filled with peace. Let's ask about one another. Let's serve one another. Let's do everything that we can do to transform this moment that we consider to be evil into a moment that offers glory to God. To God be all glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. My beloved, we've already been speaking for quite a while right now. And I see, oh my goodness, uh, it's very encouraging to see so many of you write. This is wonderful. So, beloved, I see that we have about, uh, we have almost 200 viewers right now. So this is where I'm going to tell you, please feel free to submit your questions. We'll spend the next little time trying to answer as best as we can. Um, And I'll take them as first come, first serve. So pose your questions if you'd like. We'll try to answer them as best as we can. If I don't know the answers, forgive me. I'll tell you that I don't know. Okay. So, all right. So there is a prayer or there is a post here from Marina Atallah who says, thank you, Abuna, for this. What do we make of the liturgical prayer? Those who are sick, heal them. And similar prayers in light also praying that thy will be done, even as James 1 and 2. Very good question, Marina. So as a matter of fact, um, I want us to understand the following. We are a church that has always been under persecution for as long as we can remember. So we've spent probably almost, I want to say 1,400 years at the very least, where we've been persecuted, right? And we still pray for the sick. And we pray for the protection. And we pray that our homes uh, not be burned down and that our women be safe and that our children not be abducted. And that we're praying for all of these things. And we pray that God may crush his enemies under his feet and they may hold the spirit of the church in peace and comfort. We pray for all of those things. Has it ever stopped? Has it ever stopped? No. Sometimes we actually think it gets worse. Beloved, I need you to understand the following. We don't believe in a God who we treat like a vending machine. God is not like the genie of the lamp where if you rub the right way and if you say the magic sentences, that this is some sort of like Harry Potter magic trick. Move the wand in the right way, practice it in the right way, say the words with the right tone, and then suddenly what you want happens. No, no. Well, what we truly believe is that God has two wills within him. His permissible, provincial will, and at the same time, he has his divine goodwill. This is best expressed in what we see happen in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, what we witness is the fall of mankind. God makes it very clear to Adam and Eve what his divine goodwill is for them their sanctification, their deification, that they participate in him in everything. He tells them, I've placed before you everything. Of all the trees eat, especially the tree of life, I want you to live. But there's one tree I need you to stay away from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And I have to give you that option. Because if I remove that option, you're not free. If I remove that option, you don't have any other choices but to choose me. And that would mean that you're not free. That would mean that I'm cheating you. But I don't want you to choose that. I set you up to succeed. The same way that God speaks to Joshua and he says, I have placed before you today life and death. What does he tell him to choose? Choose life, Habibi. I want you to understand that God permits certain things that he does not will. Because what was his will for Adam and Eve? That they choose him. But what did he permit them to do? He permitted them to be able to go against him, to alienate themselves from him, to separate themselves. So what I would tell you, Marina, is that when we pray for these things, we know that that's God's good's will. But when we pray for those things and things that are considered bad in our eyes still happen, we don't lose hope because we also understand that we're living in a humanity that we've contributed to its brokenness. So if I pray for the return of a sinner, if I know that a good friend or a brother, a sister, a father or mother have fallen away from God and I pray and I say, Lord, please bring them back. What do you think God does? Does God then decide to say, well, because Abuna Anthony has asked for it, sorry, so-and-so, I know that you don't want me, but because Abuna Anthony prayed, I'm going to go ahead and kick down the door of your heart and I'm going to force you to change them, I'm going to turn you into a saint so I can please Abuna Anthony. No, no. It's perfectly described in the book of Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Not I kick in the door, not I force my way in. No, I knock. Whoever hears me, whoever hears my voice, and not just hears it, and opens the door to me, then I will come in and me and my father will dine with him and we will make ourselves one with that person. I can pray for the salvation of the world because that's what I hope for. That's me aligning my will to God's divine goodwill. I can pray for the healing of the sick and align my will to God's divine goodwill. I can pray for the repentance of sinners, for the salvation of all those around me, for the knowledge of God to be to fill every heart in the world because that is me aligning my will to God's. But the only way that I can contribute to it is if I incarnationally become everything that Christ was, that I be physician to others like he was, that I administer peace and truth to them the way that Christ did, that I wash feet like he did, and that I offer myself like he did. If we all decide to do that, we will see that our prayers come true because we synergistically offered ourselves as tools in God's hands that he can use. But it's not because we don't see those things happening that it means that God has closed his ears to us. Marina, forgive me. I know that wasn't necessarily uh, all part of your question, but I hope it gives you some insight there. Can we do things that prevent coronavirus or do we just need to trust in God? A very good question. We absolutely have to do things. Beloved, <laughs> we work with God in cooperation. We don't just pray to God and then not care and not take responsibility. The same way that I can't tell God, make sure that my children never go hungry and then I never go buy food. That doesn't make any sense. I have a responsibility. So how do we do our part? By being obedient to the authorities. When they say, wash your hands, wash your hands. Use disinfectant. Use some soap. Do it properly. When it says, isolate yourself if you come out of country, isolate yourself. Be obedient. If they say, avoid crowds, respect social distancing. If they say all of those things, and these are people who are not trying to persecute the church. These are the governments who are trying to make sure that they save lives. And so we also have to do the same thing. We have to do our part so God can be magnified in us. But what do we do on top of what the authorities have said? We pray for the salvation of the world. We ask about one another over the phone or by text messages or through social media. We care for one another. We inspire each other to have a spirit of truth. When we do our part, God can work through us. But if we don't even do this, then where is God supposed to work? So the idea of I have faith without working, that makes no sense to us. So please, beloved, this is a very good question that was asked by Hallelujah. Um, we must do our part, and I encourage all of us to do so. Tamar asked the following. We know as believers that this is for our benefit, and so we can have a stronger relationship with God in our homes. But what about the unbelievers? Is it beneficial for them too? It can only be beneficial, Tamar, if we start to reach out to them. You know those people in your classroom, those people who work with you, that guy who sits in the cubicle next to you, your boss that you know is an unbeliever? This is where your Christianity can shine. Call them. Say, hey, I know it's a difficult time for all of us. I just thought I'd check in on you. Don't even mention Jesus. Be Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus. Speak like Jesus. 
Beloved, this is where they're going to see us be a light in the world. The only way that this can be beneficial to believers is when they see that we've acquired the spirit of peace. Ask about people. Care about people. Serve people as much as you can, even if it means at a distance. But for those of us who even have the opportunity, we know, for instance, that the neighbor next door, she just gave birth to an infant. Help her. Make a meal. Wrap it up. Put it in a bag, put it in a note, leave it at her doorstep, ring the door, and go back home. And then leave that note saying, I know it's a difficult time. I know you have an infant. I hope this helps. God bless you. And walk away and watch God work. That neighbor across the street who you know lost his wife just a few months ago, call about them. Ask about them. That student who is living outside the country and didn't have access to go back home, and you know they're on their own, call, ask, love, pray, offer. This is where we can have a chance truly to let the light of Christ shine through us so that the rest of the world can see that. Tamar Habiba, I hope that answers your question. Magdalena asks, how do we respond to the non-believers when they laugh at us about the end of the world? I don't think we need to speak about the end of the world, Habibi. This is not the end of the world. Uh, listen, let me take that back. I don't know if this is the end of the world. and I don't think we should be speaking as if we know. What I want to tell you is that if this is the end of my world, if I'm going to die soon, then let me focus on my repentance. We should not be going out there like crazy people talking about, it's the end of the world, it's the end of the world, all of you repent or you're going to go to hell. That's not the point of the message. We should not be speaking on God's mouth and saying things that he didn't say. Christ himself says, the son of man does not know the hour or the day. So why are we assuming that this is what's happening? If people laugh at this, it's up to them. Even people laughed at Christ. They mocked him. They want to crucify him, even throw him over a hill at some point. They want they will reject us. Christ himself says, a master, a servant is not greater than his master. If they have rejected me, they will reject you. If they have persecuted me, they, have, they will persecute you. If they have hated me, they will hate you. But let's not speak in extreme terms. Remember that spectrum. Find a balance and let God speak through you in showing mercy, compassion, love, support, and being a vessel of peace towards other people. We have Cyrus who says, in regards to the unsaved, Matthew 7, 7, 13, hell and the lake of fire, I wanted to ask why it's, uh, ask if it's literal or for all time. Cyrus, that's a wonderful question. And I think Father Gabriel actually recorded a beautiful video on this where he speaks about whether we understand the fire to be real or not. And I don't want to do it unjustice because Father Gabriel did a wonderful job. And I urge you, go on the Coptic Orthodox uh, Answers YouTube channel, go and search in the video section, you'll find it there. But the summary of it all is that we really do believe that there is a period of eternity for those who rejected God, that they have inflicted this isolation from God onto themselves. And what does it mean to be in separation or isolation or alienation from God? That if he is a source of goodness, that I live eternally without that. If he is a source of mercy, then I live in a state where there is no mercy. If he's a source of truth, then I have no truth. If he is life, then I'm constantly in a state of death. And that in and of itself is the suffering. The torment really happens because I'm alienated from all those things. Now, whether or not fire is literal in the sense where it is physical, I don't think we have to understand it that way. There are some who do, but I urge you, instead of seeing it only as a physical torment, I want us to realize that what it is is the rejection of everything that God is. But again, don't take my word for it. Father Gabriel recorded an incredible video. I think all of you would love it. Thanks, Cyrus, for the question. We have another question that says, Joyce asks, it's easier to understand that this time is an opportunity rather than wrath in thinking of our circumstances. But what about those in other parts of the world where sickness has taken over? Again, I really need you to understand, Joyce, that for those who are actually inflicted by this sickness right now, this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to bear with me. There's a word in Arabic that says, What that basically means is, it's almost as if me saying good for them. Because for those of us, who have been inflicted with a sickness, where our time of entry into the kingdom is approaching, this is the greatest time to repent. This is the greatest time to come to the knowledge of the truth. As a matter of fact, I want you to realize that the desert fathers and mothers, they inspired us to think every day as if it was our last. You know, while the world is teaching us all of this nonsense about you only live once, and Drake is writing all of these songs, I don't know who is writing all these songs, and everyone's talking about go ahead and live each day as if it's going to be the last and the biggest party. This is nonsensical. We should be living every day as if tomorrow I don't awake. What does that mean? It means that I should be reconciling with all those that I have, I have not forgiven every night. Then it means that every night I should be offering a repentance. Then it means that I should feel like I will not open my eyes. And when I do, 
Then let me set things straight so that when my eyes open, I'm in the kingdom with him. So Habibi, I don't want you to be worried about those people. I believe in a merciful God who truly knows that if there are those who never heard of him, who did not know them, that what St. Paul said in, in his epistles will be applied to them, that they will become a law unto themselves, and that my merciful God, who is capable of saving that righteous thief who said, um, remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom, that my God is also capable of remembering those who were not even capable and did not have the opportunity to ask for that. As a matter of fact, Joyce, I want you to know that you are not alone in asking that question. You know who else asked that question? I don't know if you see him here, but Abba Anthony. Then Anthony asked that question to God. You know what God's response was to Anthony? He said, what is that to you? Focus on yourself. They are my children. They are my responsibility. You focus on you. And St. Anthony was asking the same thing. What about those, O Lord, who die too young? What about those who die from hunger? What about those who did not know you? And God himself says, Anthony, what do you know about me? Don't you know that I am the source of mercy and love and compassion? Don't you know that I am the author of their creation and existence? Leave that to me. You focus on you. And I'm going to take this moment. And forgive me, Joyce, I'm not asking you to mind your own business. Not at all. I'm asking you to learn from what Anthony received as a message. I want you and me to take this opportunity to focus on my repentance, to focus on my knowledge and myself don't benefit from the transformation. Joyce, I hope that answers a little bit. Happy. All right. Let's see if there's any more questions here. Mark Mikhail asks, I'm hearing over and over that we need to pray uh, that this plague is lifted from us. But if this is God's will, should we not uh, just trust in his plan for us and the world? What should we be praying for? Well, I want to tell you, uh, Mark, that, you know, there's a saying that says, what, believe in God? But lock your doors, right? What does that mean? It means we have a responsibility to turn to God and say, Lord, we know that you've permitted this, but do not let it go longer than it has to. We know that you trust in all things. We know that we trust you in all things. And we know that in your providential goodwill, and we know that in your foreknowledge, the Lord, you have a plan. We don't know that plan, and we can't possibly understand it. But we ask you, Lord, to show mercy throughout all of this, that do not let it linger any longer than it has to. Let your name be glorified and show me how I can contribute to that. So while we pray and ask for his mercy, while we pray and ask that he stretches out his mighty and healing and powerful and miraculous hand, we also say, Lord, that during this period, show me what my role is. And that was the entire purpose of the message of the video that Agora University uh, released just a few days ago. We spoke about this idea of the storm. What does that mean? That means that sometimes what we do, is that in the middle of the storm, we think, my God is miraculous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell him, Lord, as you calm the waves in the storm while you were in the boat with your disciples, take away these waves and these storms. And then the waves don't go away and the storm rages even stronger. So we begin to panic and we say, Lord, have you forsaken me? Why? And then we turn like Peter, where he goes to Christ at the bottom of the boat and we say, are you sleeping while we're dying? Do you not care about us? And then again, we think to ourselves, surely God will respond to this and calm the storm. But there are other times where the storm has to rage. Where when Peter, there's actually in our tradition this incredible story that is accounted for, that we received from apostolic tradition that talks about how it is that Peter, even while he was in Rome, he tried to run away from his death yet again, right before his martyrdom. And that Christ appeared to him yet again while he was preaching in Rome. And that Christ told him, will you run away yet again? And in that response, Peter said, no, Lord. I will go and I will face my storm. And when he went back to Rome, he told them, not only am I willing to give up my life, but I will give it up in a way that honors him. Which means if you desire to sacrifice me, if you desire to crucify me, then do not crucify me like the Lord. Crucify me upside down. Beloved, what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes a storm must rage and God sees a reason for it. So instead of us panicking and saying, why aren't you lifting the storm? Maybe the greatest prayer that we ought to pray is, Lord, the storm rages, teach us to swim. And maybe the teaching of us to swim will allow us to survive this storm and come out stronger. So Mark, don't worry, Habibi, about praying about this. Pray that God lifts, that, shows, that he shows us his mercy, that God has compassion on creation, but at the same time tell him, Lord, also give me the faith to trust creation. But at the same time tell him, Lord, also give me the faith to trust that if you are allowing it, there is a reason, even if I don't see it.
and let this, if it doesn't answer, please message me privately. I'll be happy to repeat to you what we said. Uh, Loris asks, Hi Abuna, some people refuse the idea uh, that what is happening is not in any way a kind of anger of God. Uh, and if that happened in the Old Testament, that's because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Some people refuse the idea that what is happening is not in any way a kind of anger from God. Uh, I would probably tell you, Loris, there's no reason for us to speak as if it was the anger of God. It is not, I, I really need us to understand this. Who are we to say from what angle God is allowing this? Who are we to say this is clearly God's anger? Are you saying that he wasn't angered when, I don't know, World War I and World War II happened? Are we saying that he wasn't angry when so many of his children, both Jewish and non-Jewish, were killed by the Nazis? Are we saying that God wasn't angry during the period of slavery in the United States? That he isn't angry in the genocide of Armenia? That he wasn't angry with the genocide that continues to happen now even in Africa? So are we saying that every time something bad humanity does, that if something bad were to immediately follow it, oh, that must be God's anger? Maybe I, there's no reason for us to speak on behalf of God. What we need to do is speak to God, not speak for him. We need to come and speak to him, not speak for him. If it is his anger, I mean, if it's not his anger, I mean, has he allowed it? Yes, he has. What's my response? To point the finger and interrogate and put God on some sort of, uh, to put him on trial? To figure out what's your point? Why are you doing this? How did you allow this? Is your anger? No. My purpose is to choose him and to say, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? And clearly the message for us is repentance. The message for us is relationship. The message for us is to get to know him. Beloved, please, let's not waste our energy in listening to any of those extreme views. Let's have the balance of coming to him, bowing before him in submission and in love. I'll take one more question, and then we'll end it there. Okay, it actually looks on my screen like there's no more questions. Beloved, it's almost been an hour, and I have to tell you, um, I really am, and I think some of you might find this weird, but I am excited. I am very much excited. This is a wonderful opportunity. We have our fathers who are trying to keep the churches open for as long as they can. Some other fathers were forced to shut down their churches by the authorities. The church somewhere in the globe is offering prayers and oblations on our behalf. And we have to believe that we are truly one body. That if the priest is forced to commune even by himself, he is receiving it on our behalf. Now, some of you might say, what does that even mean? Listen. What I know is that Christ has taught us in Scripture and His Holy Spirit has worked through those who wrote the epistles to say that if one member of the body rejoices, we all rejoice. And if one member suffers, we all suffer and share in that. If one of us is capable of praying on our behalf, we all receive that blessing. And it's up to us now to transform our homes into churches. It's up to us now to demonstrate our own priestly authority that was given to us in baptism and say, Lord, let me offer to you from what is yours. What have you given me? You've given me time. I will offer that to you. You've given me children. I will offer them to you. I will invest that this home become a church. And if you're not living in a home with family, your own bedroom could shine with so much light of the Holy Spirit that it can inspire an entire, an entire generation. Beloved, I want to leave you with these words. A great saint from the Eastern Church by the name of Saint Seraphim once said, if one person acquires the spirit of peace, acquires the Holy Spirit, truly acquires it, then a thousand souls around him will be saved. Let's go ahead and count how many people are watching this. We have 202 viewers at the moment, and I don't know how many others will watch this afterwards. What if you decided that you were going to become that person? What if we use this time to acquire his Holy Spirit? Can you imagine how many will be saved? Forget the death of the body. Forget what the virus does to this flesh. What if we found the remedy at the spiritual level for eternal life? What if my sanctification, my becoming holy, my acquisition of the Holy Spirit could save others? Is that not worth the cure for eternal death? We are praying and hoping that doctors find the cure for this virus. Why don't we become a cure for all those who are suffering spiritually? I ask you to pray for me. I ask you to remember me. And I ask you to stay tuned. Because God willing, Coptic Orthodox Answers is going to continue having these live lectures every single Sunday at 1 p.m. We're going to have a variety of different speakers so all of you can benefit. Stay tuned so you can hear more about who will be speaking to us next Sunday. Pray for me. God bless you. And to God be all glory.
now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.